Well, good morning. Pastor Lee is out east, hurricane dodging still. I felt terrible. I dropped him off at the airport, and I looked at uh, the news app I have on my phone. It said, hurricane approaches North Carolina. I'm like, ooh, that's not good. But I apparently went around them because Lee was there, and God blessed him, apparently. And they are doing fine, and they're heading back this way with the rest of their belongings. Um, So we're excited to have them back in a couple weeks here. Mark Gunger wrote a, wrote a book and did a series, uh, and it was called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. And in it, he said, men and women have completely different brains. Women's brains are all connected, and they can think of lots of things at once, but men tend to think in terms of boxes, he describes. And men can only have one box open at a time, okay? And so men might, you can imagine a man's brain is like a garage, and he might go into the garage, and you might say something like, or to me, you might say something like, do you know anything about, let's say, uh, your kids? And I might go, okay, I'll open the Micah box, and I'll open it, and I'll look inside, and he'll have his awards, and I'll be like, oh, good, and I'll close it up, and I will now forget everything about it and store it, okay? Now, what he talks about is that men's favorite box, women completely do not understand, because men have a box, and when they open it, there's nothing in it. It's completely emptying. It's called, our, it's called our nothing box, and it's our favorite box, okay? And so when you see a man on the couch, he's like, and, you, and women, you ask him, like, what are you thinking about? And he says, nothing. Uh, he really is thinking <laughs> of nothing. <laughs> My brain is completely wiped out. Now, this comes into focus for me when, like, i would be sitting on my couch, and I might be just zoning out. TV may or may not be on. Doesn't really matter. And I'm zoning out, and half the house has fallen off and broken, and the kids are jumping up in front of my face like, Daddy, 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 and the dog's running in circles, and I'm totally not paying attention because I've zoned them all out. I'm in my nothing box. It's peaceful. Nothing is wrong. And my wife will come in and be like, don't you see what's happening? And I say, well, now I do. Thanks a lot. I was relaxed. I was in my nothing box. I was numb to the problems around me. This is a gift that only fathers have, right? <laughs> we can see the world burn it down. Our kids are running, and we're like, uh, ESPN's on, okay? And so we have this amazing gift to go a little numb. Now, in serious terms, as a dad, as a, as a man, and my gifting is a fixer. I was speaking with Brian Miller before he left. Uh, we work intensely with the homeless in our area. And we were talking about this idea of numbness and this idea of creeping numbness like that dad has who ignores his kids. And we were talking about that most people like us can make it about seven years with our homeless community. And it's not because we don't love the folks in our homeless community. It's because you can't fix people. And it's because we'll, we'll, we'll pour our lives into people and they'll slip back into homelessness and we'll get them into homes and they'll slip back. And you can only take about seven years before your heart gets a little numb, before you can't fix it anymore, before you can't get in their lives, and you watch one after another of our good friends who are still my friends when I see them downtown, but I've seen them slip so many times. We have this seven-year period, we feel like, where pastors can work with certain communities, and when, you, when we're fixers and we can't see it fixed, we get a little numb. I remember we were in Sudan in 2006. We were up in Upper Village, and it was, it was a very poor place. And then one day we decided to go to the lower village, which was another tribe completely called the Acholi. And when we moved into that space, it was everything you've ever seen on television. Distended bellies on children. It was completely three times poorer than the upper part, which was incredibly poor to start with. I remember walking through that and going completely numb because I couldn't fix it. My brain is a fixer. I see a problem, I have to fix this problem. I have to. And when I run into a problem that is so massive, like women holding babies to me and saying, please take them to America with you. Please take them with you so they have some future. When I cannot do that, parts of me almost die. They go numb because I I cannot pay attention to them because I can't fix it. And if I can't fix it, I have to let that part of me go numb and die a little bit because I don't want to engage with the fact that I can't control the world, that I can't make a difference that there's nothing I can do beyond love them and pray for them and leave. And and so this creeping numbness I have found seeping in and through my life, and I've had to force myself to ask the question that over the years, parts of me have become numb, parts of my soul, parts of who I am because of circumstances in life, like these things, what do I do with those parts of myself? What do I do with the dead parts of myself? What do I do with the parts that feel like they're not engaging with people anymore? That they, they, have, 
they have gone completely numb. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's the way I interact with people. What do I do with these parts of myself? What do we do with the dead parts of ourselves? Maybe you have no clue those parts of you are dead because they have been dead and numb for so long. And now we have, I have gotten here, we have gotten here through pride. My pride thinking I can fix everything, that I can control the environment, that I can solve problems, that I'm in control. I, am, I have gotten to my numbness through lack of vulnerability. I don't want to be vulnerable and open to the people around me. I have gotten here and we have gotten here through betrayal. There are parts of us that have gone numb because we've been betrayed and we cannot no longer engage with that part because it's too painful. And for many of us, we have gotten here through our disobedience. The little sins that have moved into bad habits have killed off parts of ourselves and they have gone numb. And you probably don't even think it's wrong anymore the struggles and the things you do and the things you're struggling with. And so we have these parts of us that have gone numb, that have gone dead. For whatever reason, there are parts of our human being that are no longer alive. And this is what I want to engage with today. What do we do with the parts of ourselves that have gone numb through life circumstances? What do we do with those parts of ourselves? How do we engage with God and get him to engage with us to try and move into those spaces? And this is what our story this morning is about from Luke chapter 7. Verses 11 through 18. <clears throat> now you'll find in your bulletin on the note page, if you don't have your Bible with you, you'll find this passage right on the back of the note page, okay? If you need anything, and you, that way if you're afraid of writing in your Bible as well, you can write on that note page right on the back. We continue our series on hopes and the miracles of Jesus. That there is a hope this morning that Jesus has a miracle for our numbness, that Jesus has a miracle for the parts of ourselves that have gone apathetic, in engaging with the culture and the people around us. So let's pray this morning, let's dive into God's word. Father, we're gonna open your words up this morning. We're excited to hear what you have for us. Father, may your words speak, not just to me and everyone in this room, but to everyone listening on the radio and televisions at home that can't be with us this morning, Father. May your words touch us in deep places. And may we leave different, not because we came to church and sang, but we interacted with you, Daddy. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up, and he touched the bier. They were carrying him on. And the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. The news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. <clears throat> this miracle is one that only Luke has in his gospel. Luke has independently researched his gospel. It says in the first part of Luke, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, and I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Now we think Luke probably has Mark in front of him as a source, and maybe even Matthew, and that's why they look very similar to Luke. But there's whole things that Luke has found out. He's gone out and investigated and talked to disciples and asked for stories about Jesus. And it's a beautiful thing to think about because not only was Luke's writing inspired by God, but his research was inspired by God. God helped Luke find the right stories that we would need for millennia to be the church we needed to be. He found the right stories in his research that Mark and Matthew and John would not have to encourage the church for the next several thousand years until Jesus comes. And so we have this beautiful story in front of us because a man took it on his mission, inspired by God, to research who Jesus was and to find stories that were deep and needed for the church around him. And so we have this first part that says, soon afterward, in verse 11, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Now, I need you to see this large crowd. They're coming out, they're coming with Jesus, okay, and you have another crowd coming out of this town called Nain. You may be, it might be reminiscent of a funeral scene in an old western, yeah? 
where they're coming out of town, maybe John Wayne and the Searchers or Tombstone, and you have this whole processional coming out of town, and there's maybe a band playing or there's a priest walking at the front. <clears throat> this would not look dissimilar to that. And yet, on the one side, you have Jesus approaching, and from this angle, you have this. And what you see is two totally different groups converging on each other. You have this group that is mourning with this widow. And you have this entire group of people that are completely excited because they've spent the last few days watching Jesus do amazing things. I, I'd love to hear the conversation in the crowd. Did you see him? He just walked across the water. Da, 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 da. Oh, it's awesome. Did you see him? There was one fish, a couple fish, and he made lunch for everybody. Did you see the blind guy? He sees again. And there's this, this humming in the crowd and this excitement because it's early in Jesus' ministry before he started to push people away with demands for obedience. And there's this energy in this crowd, and these two crowds are about to clash into each other, one excited and one depressed, one thrilled with life and one seeing only emptiness and darkness, and these two come together at the funeral. In ancient times, according to Barclay, you would have a group of people mourning professional mourners at the very front, and they would be yelling and wailing to express grief. And we might find that silly today, and we know the story where Jesus rebuked them, but it was probably a healthy cultural thing, probably healthier than us who stuff it all down and pretend nothing's wrong, yeah? They would go in front, and they would let it all out, and this group would help an entire family mourn properly. And so again, you have this group, excitement moving this way, disciples, these high school kids, excited for what Jesus is doing, and the professional mourners, and they're about to bump into each other, and this whole thing is about to go forward. Now, this might seem silly or necessary, but the mourners had to verbalize the pain of the family. But these mourners, I think, verbalize something else for us in our culture. There's great pain and waste in the death of a young man. Whatever culture you're from, whatever part of the world, and whenever you lived, there's nothing so hurtful as seeing a young man or woman die. To go to a funeral of one who is young. To see one who is early in the prime of life. Jerusalem says this, Jerusalem Post says this. About three weeks ago, three Israeli teenagers who were abducted by Palestinians in the occupied West Bank last month were shot at least 10 times by Palestinians. Later, the far right led Jews kidnapped and burned a young man who was Palestinian. And now we have an awful combat over there. We're sending missiles back and forth. Our world is full of dead young men. I, I, I feel their voice when I read this scripture. I feel the young men who have died in combat, whether it be World War II or whether it be Afghanistan. I hear their voices as this young man is walking out, and I wonder what God hears. Our world is full of dead young men who are killed in wars and who have been starved and who have been killed by disease, and their voice is coming through this young man. What a waste. What a waste. To lose one so young, what a waste. And we see this moment where their voices are heard possibly among us. In Genesis, it tells us when Abel was killed, his blood cried out from the ground to God for justice. The flood, if you read very carefully, one of the reasons the flood happened was to clean the earth of the blood that was screaming at God for justice. Because at the end of the flood, God says, I will never again curse the ground because of humans, but I wonder if he doesn't hear the voices of all the young that have died in unjust ways. All the young that have died unnaturally early in their lives. And I hear their voices out of this story and out of this narrative yelling at us and yelling at God, do something please about this world where we die in combat and starved and in different situations where the young die and I see it all in this young man as he runs into God himself. The voice of thousands and millions stepping into the space of this God become man. I wonder if God has always heard their voices and we have become numb to them ourselves. Speaking of numbness, I wonder if we become numb to the voices of the young who are dying all over our world. And that is a bad, bad thing because I do not think God has. And we see in this story as he encounters the young man, he has and he notices these situations still to this day. Later in the verse it says, when the Lord Jesus saw her, the widow, his heart went out to her. It says he, he had compassion on her and said, do not cry. Other versions say, again, Jesus had compassion on her. Um, how many widows has Jesus interacted with in his ministry? 
and push the church for the next 2,000 years to interact with widows, to find them where they are, widows, widowers, to find those lonely ones who have lost a spouse and to step into their space and their pain. Dr. Molina reminds us, by the way, of this. He says, remember that this woman is in great trouble. This woman Jesus meets is in incredible trouble since she has no family connections left alive. Her life expectancy would be incredibly short. Incredibly short. A son was the mother's lifelong protector and her ultimate social security. This woman, with her son dead and her husband dead, had no one to take care of her. And while today that is incredibly sad and can make one destitute, in that day it was a death sentence. This woman had nowhere to go. She had no one to take care of her. She had nothing. It was basically saying to her, within a few months, you will be dead because no one can take care of you. So not only is she mourning her son as she's walking, she's stepping into bleak darkness with no future ahead of her. And this is the woman Jesus sees, and this is the woman Jesus has compassion for. The word there for compassion we've talked about before, it's a deep upwelling from the very bottom of who you are and the movement of pain to another person. Jesus did not just have sympathy by this way on this woman. He had deep, total empathy. Because he knew what she was going through. Sometimes I'm a little dense when it comes to the Bible. And I wonder, why did Jesus care so much about widows? Why did he care so much? Yes, there's a destitution there, there's a forgetfulness there. But we forget at the very core, his mother was a widow. And he was the one to take care of her. And he knew he was going to die and leave her. Mary was a widow. Jesus walked out of a town once with his own mother and buried their father, his father, Joseph. Mary was a widow. He watched in pain as she suffered. She was a widow. She had to depend upon her sons, including Jesus. We forget he was a human and God. We forget he lived in human circumstances and he's gone through everything we've gone through. He buried his own dad and watched his mom mourn, probably at a very young age for his mom. And he himself is probably still taking care of his mother. So we see Jesus in this crazy miracle, his compassion of wells. And by the way, something really cool about this miracle, something amazing, is this miracle is not triggered by faith. Almost every miracle right before this is a centurion servant. He says, your faith has healed you. Jairus' daughter, who he raises from the dead, Jairus' faith heals the girl. The, sometimes it's friend's faith, right? The two guy, four guys that dig through the roof and lower their friend down. Jesus says, your friend's faith has healed you. Most scripture, it's the faith of the one who asks for healing. This woman never asks. Never. I love this. Because sometimes we don't even know we need healing. Sometimes Jesus steps in even though we have not invited him in. And he steps into this woman's space, and he sees her pain, and he heals her. Whether She does this miracle not for the man on the bier, not for the dead man. He does it for the woman. Not out of her faith, not because she asks for it, because he feels compassion for her. Because he sees the situation she's in, just like his mother, and he does something about it for this woman. He feels deep compassion for this woman. The miracle's not for the young man. It is for the woman and this widow who reminds him, of his mom. I take great comfort in this. Listen very carefully. Frederick Buchner states this, that Jesus is amazing because you do not need to understand healing to be healed, and you do not need to understand blessing to be blessed. You do not need to understand healing to be healed. He will heal you anyway. If you don't understand the theology behind it, maybe you even get it wrong, he's going to heal you anyway. And there are times you forget to ask, and he moves anyway because he loves you and he loves us and he moves in even though we have not necessarily asked and this is the beauty of this story you do not need to understand healing to be healed but then this third thing happens right sees the woman he has a rise of compassion out of himself that thing most of us have numbed down when it starts you're like i can't do anything about it let's just stuff that compassion back down because i feel compassion but i can't fix the situation so it's time to let that numb out a little bit forget it I can't help that person or this person. So I'm just going to let that go down back into my soul. And it says this, Then he, being Jesus, went up and he touched the coffin. He touched the bier the young man was on. And the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. I love how Jesus touches 
this funeral beer. John Petty says this, notes that Jesus becomes unclean by touching that. He becomes ceremonial unclean because you don't touch things dead people are touching, okay? And John Petty notes that Jesus, by touching the beer, Jesus became unclean, not that he cared. He never seems to have missed an opportunity to make himself impure. <laughs> He's like, not supposed to touch that person. Oh, really? Bing! <laughs> not supposed to touch that. Okay, da-da. You notice that uncleanliness never flows into Jesus. It was a myth back then that a healer would lose his healing abilities if he became unclean. That's why the, the story of the woman who touches his cloak, that's why she's so terrified. Because she realizes that by touching him, she made him unclean. But it never flows to him. He loves it. He's like, hello. And he touches dead people. You're not supposed to do that. Okay. And he just does it anyway. You're not supposed to do it on the Sabbath. Okay. And he does it anyway. He goes out of his way to break the rules because people matter over rules at this point for him. And he's trying to move into spaces and do something different. And I love that the guy sits up and just starts talking. Because that's what I would do. I'd probably just carry on the conversation I was having when I died. I'd probably sit up, so it's Starbucks today. It was a good day. And I just started blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that's exactly what I would do, okay? Or maybe you wake up and be like, oh, what happened? <laughs> and you just start talking. Because you realize you've been brought back. I love he just sits up and starts going off and just having a conversation. But notice what Jesus says and how he says it here. Elijah and Elisha raised widows' sons in First and Second Kings. But they do it kind of strange. By the way, in fact, the town where Elisha raised, called Shunem, where he raised the widow's son, is Shunem. Shunem is like a 10-minute walk from Nain. There's, there's meaning to where Jesus is in doing these things. But in the stories, Elijah and El Elisha have to lay on the young man in kind of this awkward position. And they say they lay on the young man mouth to mouth, hands to hands. Um, I don't even like hugging people, much less that. Okay? And he lays on the man, he prays, and the young man woke up. And both times they did this, laid on the young man, and he, they prayed to God and asked him to heal him, and they did. Notice Jesus' words are completely different. By the way, this is why at the end of the phrase, end of the story, they say a great prophet has come among us because they see Jesus did something Elijah and Elisha did. And it's connected straight back to those stories. And yet we know him as greater than a prophet. But, but there's something that Jesus does here completely different. He commands it to be. He never asks, he commands it. It reminds me of Yahweh, our God. The earth is formless and void. It is dark. And into the darkness, he says, let there be light, and there's light. God can command the darkness. God's words are different than our words. We feel like our words are symbolic, and they, the only meaning is that they symbolize something out there in reality. For God, words are powerful. And when God decides to speak into darkness, things happen. Creation happens. And Jesus sees a dead man, the darkest of our fate of humans. And at this moment, he becomes not just the Lord of life, he becomes the Lord of death. And he speaks and commands and sends his words into the darkness to change the darkness. The darkness saw him but did not understand him, John says. The darkness saw him but did not understand him. And so he speaks into the darkness and he sends these words into the death of this young man. I say to you, rise. I say to you, rise. Jesus commands the death. And the two crowds become one of shock and joy like that. Two crowds, one mourning, one excited, become one big crowd together as Jesus interrupts the funeral possession. Now this, this story has haunted me as only great scripture can do and really only the words of Jesus can do. I've been studying it for about a month and it has haunted my very soul as I've struggled with this and it's, I've never had a story and a narrative about who Jesus is haunt me like this story. These words have remained in my, my mind and my heart for a month. Because sometimes we send Jesus' words down into ourselves. And we, we, we digest and actually lift the barriers and we allow God's words to move into our minds. We really do. We don't just memorize them. We allow them to invade our hearts and our minds and heal us. And these words, I hear them in my heart. I say to you, rise. I say to you, rise. I hear him whispering to the numb and dead parts of me. I say to you, 
rise. It ekes into the numb and rebellious and dead parts of myself. I've invited Jesus' voice into my heart, which is one of the, the most dangerous things you will ever do in your life. And it has very little to do with church and being here. It has to do with interacting with the real God of the universe. And when you take his words and let them sink deep and you chew on them, and you guys, you open those boxes you haven't opened a while in your garage, and you invite those words into those spaces, he brings life to them slowly once again. He says, Jeremiah, I say to you, rise. And I hear it whispered in my heart for the last month. I hear him say, Cliff, I say to you, rise. I hear, Anne, I say to you, rise. I say to you, rise, Barbara, rise. And those words invade us. And they change us from the inside out because they are the words of our Lord and our God. And when we let his words invade the parts of us that are numb and dead, something diff different happens. I need you to see these two crowds. I need you to see them coming together because I need you to remember for all of you, he interrupted your funeral procession. For all of you, he did this. You were dead. And you have all heard the words as the Jesus of the universe, the God, the living word, stepped in front of you. You have all heard the words, I tell you, rise. I do not understand this story even a little bit. But like the widow, I know I've been seen by Jesus. I don't understand everything that's happening here. I wish I could heal people like that. I don't even fully understand the depths of the words I tell you rise. But I do understand that he has seen me and he has interrupted my funeral procession. He stepped in front of me, he laid hands on me and said, I tell you rise, Jeremiah, and I did. And he is invading those spaces to this day as I invite him into the dead parts of myself. We were noticed when we were dead. And some of you are still dead. And remember, you have been noticed. Let these words eke into the deepest parts of who you are this morning. I thought about a three-step application this week. I thought about giving you like step one, pray. Step two, invite God in. I don't want to do that this week. I have no peppy ending to the talk. I have nothing for you because sometimes sermons look more like self-help from me too than they do at getting you to God. Sometimes my three steps actually get you away from God than getting you to God. And I want to do something awesomely terrifying for you this week. I want you to get with God. I want you to take these words into your spaces this week. I want you to take the words, I say to you, rise, and let it invade Monday. I want you to write on a card. I want you to put it in your soul. You can memorize it. Trust me. It's short, kids, okay? It's shorter than most of your song lyrics. I say to you, rise. I want you to wake up Monday morning, and I want you to say, I say to you, rise. And let the living Christ's word through the Holy Spirit, let that phrase invade you. Let it invade the dead parts of yourself. You let that in, he'll be like, this spot. And you're going to be like, I didn't even know that was dead. He goes, it is. I say to you, rise. Rise up. Rise from your death. Rise from your numbness. Care again, even though you can't fix it. Obey me again, even though you've disobeyed for so long, you can't even remember what you do is wrong. I say to you, rise. Let him invade the dead parts of you. Let him. Invite him in. Those five words will disrupt your life in such a beautiful way as only the words of Jesus can. Only his words can do this and disrupt us and heal us somehow at the exact same time. At the very end of the scripture, it says God has come to help his people. The, the people proclaim it. And I wonder if they would say that about us. Because to me, these words, I say to you, rise, the interruption of the funeral procession, it has happened to us and it's still happening. But there are so many people around you that need those words. There are so many dead that surround you everywhere you go, whether you take your car to the mechanic or the car wash, or you go to McDonald's, you go to Starbucks, or you're in Covenant Village and your neighbors don't know who Jesus is, or they're just dead and maybe they do, and they're numb and they watch TV all day and they have nothing to live for, and your coworkers and your friends at school, and you see them and they're dead, and they need to hear the words, I tell you, rise. Martin Luther makes an observation. He says there were eight to ten other men who were touching 
the funeral bier, who were touching the casket. There were 18 other men who were touching the casket, and only Jesus' touch brought life. What does your touch do to the caskets around you? What does your touch do? I want to start interrupting some funerals because I believe God has given me the power to take his words into the world and to step into spaces and to tell a different story for people and in the end to say to them, Christ is risen and he tells you to rise, to stop living in darkness. He died for you and he lived for you. Life is a story and I carry these words inside of me, I tell you rise. I want to be the one who steps in front of funerals this week. I want to be the one that steps in front of funerals. Father, thank you for disrupting our lives. Thank you for the great interruption that you represent to us. Father, we thank you for your son, and we thank you for your living word that still is so different than anything else humans have ever written. Father, you inspired this Bible that it may invade our hearts and read us and tell us about ourselves. So, Father, these words, I tell you, rise. Let them invade us, Father. Let them invade us. We love you dearly, Lord Jesus. We love you for what you did for that woman who didn't even ask, and we love you for interrupting our funeral marches as well. Let us be people who do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing one song, one of my favorites this morning? How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, a shame. sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. May his words, I say to you, rise, haunt you and chase you and revive numb and dead parts of yourself. And may you notice the dead around you and may you have compassion on them and may you find ways to breathe Jesus' words into them. May you live the words, I tell you, rise. Go in peace, Crossroads Church, and we will see you next week.